Thank you, Jeff. And uh, this is a, uh, maybe a, almost a superfluous talk after what Jeff just relayed by way of the history, because I think he traced a lot of the things that we've learned about how to do this and do it, do it well and improve our outcomes as we do it. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I go about it. I hope to share a few pearls that I've learned along the way, mostly from mistakes. Uh, some of them, again, Jeff has already mentioned. I have nothing to disclose. And basically, Jeff outlined this already, but there's several ways to put in pegs. I'm sure most of you in the audience have probably worked with all these. I'm going to briefly mention them. I'm going to, I'm going to highlight a few things about the pool method that Jeff already described, and then talk a little bit more about the introducer method or Russell technique, as Jeff alluded to, uh, as I think a good alternative strategy for those of you that may not have, have uh, used that before, and particularly if you deal with a lot of people with head and neck uh, malignancies. The kits have become, as Jeff already outlined, uh, something that has simplified this for all of us compared to the early days he described. And basically, the things in the kit that, that help us set it up well are things that promote uh, just one set of materials to help us accomplish all the things pertinent to the procedure. Uh, and I'll go through some of these as we talk. Uh, the key steps, uh, I love Jeff's slide showing the, how the light went on in his own head as they looked at these babies' abdominal walls. But, Still, the, the cardinal thing about placement, unless you use some adjunctive technique, which we'll briefly touch on later, like laparoscopy, is the corresponding focal indentation of the anterior gastric wall with external compression, not a whole hand, not a fist, but a finger, and transillumination. And with the newer scopes, sometimes you have to use a higher intensity setting or a transillumination feature uh, because the intensity is not the same as it was in the old fiber optic scopes. But if you don't see those two things, you really need to reevaluate whether PEG is the best strategy, at least in the traditional sense of the word. The safe track technique is something that came about after I did my initial training, so I'm really getting old. But I think it does add, and especially in a teaching setting, to have your residents get used to this discipline of putting in a small caliber needle. You can use the same needle you use to inject the subcutaneous tissue with local. Uh, and make sure that uh, they aspirate as they go in and that they don't get air back till they see the tip penetrate the gastric lumen as a way of helping to be sure you're not going through another organ or, or at least decreasing the chance of that. Uh, and I think this has been a helpful addition. Jeff alluded to the use of prophylactic antibiotics. In my own practice, I still apply the rule he taught me as a fellow, which is if they're already on antibiotics for something else with it, which an awful lot of PEG patients are for a variety of reasons, that's probably sufficient as long as you maintain the dosing period procedurally. But otherwise, a single prophylactic dose definitely is efficacious in reducing infectious risk. And the other thing I've learned is making that incision properly is very helpful. And you can make mistakes here if the pa you know, if you have a patient who's under conscious sedation, is prone to aspiration, their head's up a little bit up, uh, heads up a little bit, I put in tubes where the angulation in the abdominal wall has been a problem when they later laid the patient flat. And it can create a little bowing or tension that affects the track and causes some tissue ischemia. Uh, and the size of the incision, uh, while we like to think of this as, as a way of doing something minimally invasive, I learned that I wanted to make the incision just a little bit bigger than the size of the tube, because that helps keep things from being trapped in that sub-Q space. Uh, so those are a few pearls along the way. Jeff's outlined the basic technique, uh, and I won't belabor this, but the use of a snare and a wire. If you use the pull technique, one of the looped wires that you can then engage in a square knot fashion by a simple pull-through technique with the loop at the end of the, the prepackaged uh, pull tube is the technique we most often use. I do uh, like to reintroduce the scope. Part of this is being in a teaching setting. I want my residents to see what their final position is. I like to still do the thing Jeff taught me of spinning the tube and making sure that it, the inner dome doesn't distort the gastric mucosa or twist it. It's one of the ways you can help assure you're not creating too much tension. Uh, and the way we do that, sorry, the way we do that is to put the snare on the bumper as we pull the tube back into place, and that pulls your scope right back in uh, to position in a fairly simple fashion. Uh, Jeff mentioned the push method. I have had very brief periods in my career where I've used this. Uh, I essentially view it as another way to use the pull technique. Uh, it doesn't involve a looped wire. I don't think that really simplifies things. Uh, and really everything else, once 
once you get the wire in place, it's all really very similar to what, what we do with the pull technique. But sometimes uh, the habits at an institution, like with surgical procedures, uh, can make this be the kit you have available. And in those settings, it's certainly a reasonable way to do the procedure. This has become a more prominent part of what I get to do in my current practice. And uh, the patients that come in with active, so not resected or treated, but active head and neck cancers, we now know that we can do harm if we pull tubes through that active area. And the majority of patients don't get this problem, but it's a big problem when it happens. And they can get seating to their abdominal wall. And here's a couple pictures, both a, 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 just a photograph of the patient's abdominal wall and a CT scan where this occurs. So we like to look for an alternative strategy in those settings that doesn't involve, like the pull or push techniques do, bringing the, the tube itself uh, through the tumor area. And Jeff described the introducer technique. I, I have some of Jeff's old slides, some of B. Pen, Pan, Chan's slides in here, so you'll see some of these pictures again and again. But um, this allows us a way of doing the procedure uh, without dragging the tube through, and the endoscope's there for visual, visualization. You can easy, even use a small caliber endoscope, uh, like a nasopharyngeal scope if you need to, uh, because of the caliber of the esophageal lumen. Uh, but Jeff described well some of the challenges with this, and I've had this happen to me where I'm partway into the procedure and everything starts to deflate, and all of a sudden that stomach wall is falling away. So this is, as you saw in Jeff's slide, this was the original technique as described. This is how I do it now. Um, and again, this is a pretty good percentage of, of my own peg practice as using these T-fasteners. Uh, and you can see in the uh, upper uh, right where the fasteners look in the lumen of the stomach. I usually place them in a little triangle centering around the area I'm going to put the tube. And then the tube itself in the introducer assembly goes right in the middle of that little triangle. One reason to think about this, you know, it's funny, at our institution, our biggest and most frequent problem is early tube dislodgement. My trauma acute care surgeons, we've had probably four or five of these in the last few months, and it's become something we're paying attention to. And I actually think that the post-PEG patients look worse than the people on the site ward in straight jackets because they get wrapped in binders and their hands are restrained and there are bridles everywhere in their body and it's just so one way to obviate that is to think about putting in these t-fasteners it helps to protect against the early tube dislodgement i certainly wouldn't do it routinely but if you have a patient population uh, that's mentally disabled and active physically it might be something to think about and these are just some of the steps that we use with, the, with that kind of kit. You can see the luminal view. And basically, once you get the T-fasteners the in, puncture with a needle in the center of that little perimeter, thread the wire. And you can see in the endoscopic photos, I try to direct the wire down towards the pylorus and even into the duodenum so that the dilator assembly goes in a, in a direction where there's a good luminal view. If you're, if you're doing this more perpendicularly, you can this, they're stiff enough, the current kits, that you could direct that and do some damage to the posterior gastric wall. So I try to be conscious uh, of where the luminal aspect is in, in all steps of the procedure. You see the peel away sheath in the far right picture. And this is the finished product. And those T-fasteners, uh, you can take out the external part of those in a week or two or when I see the patient back for a follow-up visit. I don't leave them in long term. Let's see. And then just a couple, Jeff alluded to one of these that he and BPAN described. Uh, just to, the, the point I want to make here is that uh, if you look at the history of therapeutic endoscopy, and PEG is a great example of this, uh, surgeons have often been the ones to come up with creative ideas and problem solving. So to think about what you've got in your hand already and the slick technique that BPAN and Jeff and colleagues at the clinic described using a radially expanding trocar to do an introducer type technique or this technique of uh, percutaneous transesophageal gastrostomy tubes that's been described uh, by the Japanese uh, using a, a intraluminal esophageal tube that's puncturable to direct a wire down through a cervical approach into the stomach and then uh, put a tube in that can be hidden uh, underneath the patient's collar. Uh, and I just raise these as alternative strategies for special or complicated situations uh, to have in your armamentarium or at least be aware of. Uh, 
Success rates are very high, and Jeff's alluded to why the most common reasons to be replaced. There's a couple talks later on the program about complications, so I'm not going to dwell on this. I'll just conclude by briefly describing kind of the pearls, things I've learned along the way. Jeff alluded to this. Really, the thing I most often feel like I contribute, because everybody's doing the procedure now, is careful patient selection. And the most common thing I, I do by way of adding something is to teach the residents to say no to those people who have a very limited life expectancy or other reasons that we shouldn't make our first step an invasive enteral access. Uh, think about where you want to do the procedure, and I found that there are some kinds of patients that I very much want to do with airway control and even paralysis, uh, and I think about that ahead of time. Avoiding tension, avoid tension, avoid tension. It's like see the lumen, see the lumen, see the lumen. See, you brainwashed me. Uh, but avoiding tension is really the hallmark of a safe, enduring peg. And then think about your alternatives for special situations. Thank you very much.